We're here to empower high income earners to gain back control of your time through financial independence and stop trading your time for money and start letting your money work harder for you. And hey, if you want to meet other high income earners on their FIRE journey, join our High Income Earners FIRE Facebook group. Every month we'll have guest speakers and we'll share about what our team is currently working on and allow you to share what you are working on with other high income earners. Welcome to today's episode of the High Income Earners FIRE podcast. I'm your host, Eileen Prack. Unfortunately, today, not able to be joined by my co-host, Cody Ye, but we have a phenomenal guest with us here today, Mikkel Thorup. He is the founder and CEO of Expat Money, a private consulting firm which started back in 2017, where he focuses on helping high net worth private clients to legally mitigate tax liabilities, obtain a second residency and citizenship, and assemble a portfolio of foreign investments, including international real estate, timber plantations, agricultural land, and other hard money tangible assets. And he's also the host of the popular weekly podcast, The Expat Money Show and also wrote the definitive number one best-selling book, Expat Secrets, How to Pay Zero Taxes, Live Overseas, and Make Giant Piles of Money. And Mikkel, I like your background so much. Uh, where you came from, you know, you had a uh, little bit of a setback or what people would say, call a disability as a young kid. You've been able to rise and bring yourself up to where you are today. So I'm super excited to have this conversation with you and share with our audience as well. So welcome to the show, Mikkel. Thank you very much, Eileen. Yeah, we talked before and we got to talk a lot about those. And and hopefully your audience from this podcast will get to check out the amazing work you do in your other program, which is I'm a big fan of your work. I think you do some really excellent stuff. So hopefully people can check that out as well. But uh, yeah, happy to go in whatever direction today you want to, and, and talk about uh, some of the investment opportunities and how I've been able to build freedom in my own life. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mikkel. Um, So let's give the listeners a little bit more about your background, because I think it's so important to start from the roots and where you come from and give us a picture of where you are today. Sure. So I'll try to keep it as concise as possible, but I do have to go quite far back in time. So um, I'm from southwestern Ontario. I'm a Canadian citizen. And uh, when I was a child, I was actually diagnosed with a learning disability. So what happened, Eileen, is they um, when I was in grade three, they pulled me out of class one day and they sat me down in a little room and there was the principal and the vice principal and maybe like a resource teacher there. And they said to me, OK, Mikkel, something doesn't work quite right in your brain. And what we want to do is we want to send you to a special school, special school for special boys. So that's what they did. Every day for three years, I got on a little white bus and I took a little white bus across town and I went to this quote unquote special school. Now, the only problem I lean was it was actually not a special school. It was a regular school with a special class. So you can probably imagine what happened. I got in a ton of fights. I got picked on. I got bullied. And all in all, it was a pretty terrible experience. Now, this is no woe is me, poor Mikkel, poor Mikkel. I'm a victim type of mentality. Absolutely not. I don't subscribe for any of that kind of stuff. And when I got hit, I hit back. I would never claim otherwise. And if possible, I would hit back twice as hard. So, <laughs> you know, like I I would not claim otherwise. But um, after three years, Eileen, I got to go back to my neighborhood school. And I thought this is going to be so amazing. All my friends, they will have missed me. They're going to be so exciting to see me. And then once again, you can probably imagine what happened. So day one of school, I show up and everybody starts gossiping and whispering. And, oh, I remember Mikkel, he went to some retard school. Thanks, guys. Very, very sensitive. You know how kids are, you know, very politically correct, very sensitive. But um, I really didn't like my experience in state-run school or public education. And... Um, so I stopped going. And when I stopped going, I would fail. And somehow they would push me into summer school and I would fail that. And then the next year I would start failing again. And uh, long story short, I stopped going to school when I was 12 years old. And I officially dropped out when I was 15. And I started traveling internationally not long after that. And what I found, Eileen, is when I started traveling internationally, first of all, people did not know my background. They didn't know that I had this quote unquote learning disability, um, which a side note is a, a form of dyslexia, which we now know in today's day and age that it's really not a big deal whatsoever. But at, you know, back in the 1980s and early 90s, you know, it seemed to be this horrible, horrible thing. But um, so no one knew my background and I could create my life however I wanted to, you know, as long as I'm being honest and ethical, I should be able to do whatever I 
want in the world. As long as I'm not hurting people or stealing or things like this, you know, I should be able to create my life. And the other big thing that I saw right off the bat was that there's not only one way to learn things. Actually, there's many ways to learn things. And what works for some people in public education and rote memorization absolutely did not work for me whatsoever. So I started traveling internationally and I really felt like I had found my people, like I found my peeps, like, you know, like I, this was, this is where I belonged. And uh, fast forward today, and uh, I've been traveling for almost 23 years straight, like continual travel around the world. I've circumnavigated the globe over 400 times. I've visited, I think I'm at 110 countries now, and I've lived in nine different countries. And this is what I built my business on. This is my personal life. This is my hobby. This is everything has to do with living overseas and being financially independent and and what that looks like. So, you know, we can kind of go in whatever direction you like and and dissect that a little bit and what it means for my business and how I help people and and how I found these things out myself. But that's just a little bit about my background and where I come from, because I think it is important that people understand who I am, you know, if you want to work with me or, or get involved in the in the community that we're building. I think it's so interesting because a lot of times like the traditional path, you know, people say you have to go to school, get that good education, get that higher degree to be able to become successful, get a, you know, a stable career, stable job. But you went a totally different path, very outside of the norm. Not many typical people are able to do what you are able to do, built up an incredible business and have been able to travel so many different countries and live life very fulfilling. And so For you, when you left the United States to first go traveling, what did you see first? And like, what did you decide you wanted to take your life in which direction? How did you make that decision? So I'm Canadian. So I left Canada, not the US. Sorry, yes, you're Canadian. Yes. But I was a teenager. I didn't really know what I was doing. But I had grown up with my father telling me that travel was the greatest thing he ever did with his life. And I really thought, wow, this is amazing. You know, um, I saw all the pictures of him backpacking when he was in his 20s and he had like long hair because it was like the 70s and stuff. And um, But I never understood, Eileen, why, you know, if travel was the greatest thing he ever did with his life, then why did he not do more of it? But anyways, I, I went to Western Europe on my first trip and I got to see a little bit of the world and I realized my father was correct. Travel is the best thing you can ever do and to continue on with these types of things. So I traveled, my first couple of trips were through Western Europe. My second trip was also through Western Europe, but I ran out of money halfway through and uh, I went down to Morocco. So it was my first time being in a developing country and it was very, very different. First of all, it's a Muslim country and they have a very rich culture and history. And I spent two months backpacking around Morocco. And uh, I remember I actually went down to the Sahara Desert and I decided I wanted to go to Algeria. So I got on a camel. We got a we organized a camel trip and we took three days across the Sahara and went to Algeria and back. It took about three or four days. And, uh, you know, I was pretty crazy when I was in my teenage years, like pretty fearless. You know, I, I'm still don't have many fears at all. But um, but yeah, that was pretty Pretty crazy, even for me, I think, to do things like that at such a young age. But yeah, I've traveled um, pretty extensively all over the world, took 18 months and hitchhiked and backpacked through Central and South America. You know, I've traveled to North Korea, to Iran. I've drove across Africa a couple of times, lots of different places. And it's really shown me how big the world is and how there's not only one way to to view the world or to look at situations. There's many different perspectives out there. Often in Canada, in the United States, we seem to are raised or believe that we have the best way of doing it, that ours is the right way and the rest of the world is weird and strange and some kind of jungle, you know. I can tell you from a lot of experience that this is not the case. Um, actually, it's all about perspective and it comes down to um, to individual cultural and religious and historical differences. But the world is a really big place and there's a lot to explore. How did you fund your travels, especially since you didn't uh, didn't sound like you really went back to Canada and didn't, you know, go back to school or didn't get a job in Canada, but you were still traveling internationally? How did you fund all of that? 
So I picked up whatever odd jobs I could when I was quite young. Um, I did mostly hospitality work for the first, I don't know, for many years at the beginning, was just trying to scrape together any money that I could. I was practicing geo arbitrage before it ever became a mainstream term. You know, I always kind of figured that, all right, if I can make you know, I think minimum wage was like $6 an hour or something when I started working. Uh, and I'm kind of dating myself here. But, you know, in Guatemala, where I was spending a lot of time, I, I lived in Guatemala for about six months. I think it was maybe $10 a day to live there for your accommodation and your food and maybe taking a little tuk-tuk somewhere or having a beer. So basically, you know, every hour that I worked or every two hours that I worked, I could pay for an entire day to live in Guatemala. So it's like, all right, if I work for a month, then, you know, how many days is that going to be? If I work for six months, how much is that going to be? So I would just save up money and then travel and save up money and then travel. Uh, we didn't really have digital nomadism back in the day because although technically the internet existed, it was not like it was. The technology wasn't there yeah. at that time. Yeah, it was web 1.0. So it's static websites. There's no interaction between them. There's, you know, they don't have freelancer websites like Upwork or things like that now. Um, I mean, they would be internet cafes and once a month I would go over there and I would write uh, my family or something like that. But mostly I was keeping in touch with my family via postcards. You know, I would send them postcards everywhere I went. But um, yeah, I mean, things have changed a lot in those times. Um, but I was just working at whatever job I could to earn money and then geo arbitrage to maximize my travel. Years later, I got into personal finance and uh, and then eventually entrepreneurship, which we can discuss. But uh, at the beginning was very, very humble beginnings. When you say geo arbitrage, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So I kind of take the term for granted, but really is maximizing different jurisdictions and taking the best from them. So in my example before is working in a first world country, like I lived in Australia. I lived in Australia from 2006 to 2009, earned a very, very nice salary while I was there, and then used that money and traveled through Southeast Asia, where the cost of living is, you know, five times less or 10 times less or something like that. Um, when I was in Canada, I worked in the ski resorts in Banff and Lake Louise, and I saved up a lot of money out there. And that's what I used to go and hitchhike and backpack through Latin America. And I've done this over and over again around the world. Um, some other examples of geo arbitrage would be owning an online business right now. But instead of uh, hiring employees, actually, it wouldn't even have to be an online business. It could be any type of business. But instead of hiring employees where you live, it might be hiring someone in a country where the wages are a lot less. So for example, I have a lot of employees that work for me who are from Brazil. I have people who work for me from Argentina. I was just in Argentina a couple of weeks ago. Minimum wage is $1 an hour. I pay my employee $5 an hour. So I'm giving him a 500% increase in his salary. But $5 an hour for me is fantastic. You know, he's got experience. He's really good guy. He's got a good head on his shoulder. He's very freedom orientated. And I'm very grateful to be able to get that caliber and the motivation from someone like that. And it's still very affordable for me. Now, if I had to go to the US and Canada and hire an employee and I had to pay all of the social security and all of these extras and minimum wage is $15 an hour and the attitude is not there because maybe the caliber of the person that you're getting is very low, then that makes it really difficult. So geo arbitrage allows me to leverage different jurisdictions on things that are going to help me grow my business and, and take advantage of it and take advantage of it, not in an, a way which is unethical or, or nasty or mean or anything like that. Like I said, I'm paying five times as much and they're very happy to do the work. So it is a voluntary exchange of uh, their time for my dollars. And we've organized this amongst ourselves. So it really is a win-win scenario here. Right. It's just a standard of living. The cost of living over there is much less than what it would be over here. So like you mentioned, $1 an hour is a typical average salary that they would get, but he's making five times more than the average person in Brazil. So it's a, like you said, win-win situation for both you and him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's fast forward then to when you decided to start your entrepreneurship journey, how did that begin? And what did you decide to do first um, when embarking on that? Uh, next chapter of your life? Sure. So 
when I decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I don't think it was like today I am going to be an entrepreneur. It's not like, <laughs> it's not like a starting you know moment in history, but I had been into personal finance for about seven years, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, I first got interested when you, in equity. Sorry, I want to just interrupt really quick. When you say personal finance, can you also expand when, what do you mean by personal finance and what were you doing in that, in that sense? Sure, absolutely. So uh, really taking responsibility for my own money, uh, understanding how things work and put things together, learning about investing, learning about compound interest, learning about banking and savings and insurance and all of these types of things. You know, just really taking ownership of my own education. You know, like I said earlier, I left school at a very young age. That doesn't mean that I stopped learning or that doesn't mean that I'm not educated. You know, I read on average about 100 to 120 books a year. Um, and I have done that for well over 20 years. So when I say I've read over 2,000, two to two and a half thousand books in my life, that's a true statement. Like I'm not exaggerating by any means. I keep track of everything like that. The majority of those books, not all of them, but the majority of them have to do with business and finance and economics and geopolitics and these types of things, which I kind of all bring into the financial sphere, or at least for me, that's how I view it. So I had gotten first interested just in the concept of money and understanding the history of money and, and commerce, how this works. And then from there, got interested in equities and, um, and the stock market and things like this, and then found options trading, which really spoke to me. Derivatives trading was just the most exciting thing in the world and understanding how things work. Now, I was never a proponent for buying options. I was more interested in selling options. So selling contracts, you can kind of think about it as writing insurance for equities, for, for securities. And that's what I did for seven years. And I made a lot of money and I blew up my portfolio a couple of times, which is a fantastic learning experience. Was it painful to lose several hundred thousand dollars, and, you know, in a short period of time? Absolutely. You know, but, you know, taught me a lot of really valuable things. And I'm glad that I did it when I was much younger and I did it with my own money. You know, I thankfully never done anything like that with clients money. I practice on myself first. But uh, at some point, I decided I wanted to do entrepreneurship. And I started with other small businesses. I was really big into fitness and to, to health and um, you know dietics and things like that. And that's what I thought I wanted to do. So I tried a couple business like that, uh, failed at them as well, could not make it work. Once again, a great learning opportunity. There's nothing better than failing at something, trying it out, having a hypothesis, and then giving it everything you got. And it doesn't work. You know, um, you learn a lot of skills along the way. But uh, about seven years ago, I sat down and I started really thinking, what do I want to do? And I decided to take my two biggest passions in this world, my two biggest loves. So one, traveling and being an expat. And the other, finance and money and commerce and investing. And I mashed them together and I created the expat money, or uh, at the time was the expat money show, was the podcast that we started. And I just started talking about these ideas, talking about them, writing about them. I had already been doing a bit of a newsletter, so putting the, the content in there. And uh, fast forward now, we've been going for about seven years, get several million people who read or listen to my stuff every single year, uh, inspired thousands of people and worked with hundreds of private clients on figuring all of these things out. And it's good. It's really rewarding. And it's really like... I just love it. You know, I just think being able to talk about these ideas every single day. And, and that's why I'm so thankful to come on your podcast today and, and speak with you and discuss a lot of these concepts. And, you know, I just hope to be able to give people a different perspective and inspire them on, on different options and, and what is out there and how the world fits together and it works because it is a big place, as I was saying before. No, I love that. When you talk about personal finance and learning about, you know, the history of money and how it works and applying it to your own situation, what was the biggest, I guess, what was the biggest takeaway that you took from it um, in comparison to what people would normally think about money and how you manage it and how you think about um, how it works in the world? Oh, that's a good question. So I'm not sure if I can pick one particular thing. You know, I've spent a lifetime studying economics and history. I guess one of the main things is really starting to understand that governments are not your friend, 
a Federal Reserve and the banking charters and things, these people are not your friends whatsoever. In most cases, or in pretty much in all of cases, they're the enemy. So you have to be really, really careful with how you invest and what you do. You know, taxation and what it is used for, what it is said it is used for, and what it is actually used for are very different things. We have an invisible tax called inflation, and people are really feeling it right now. I think mm -hmm. the published numbers are 7.9%, but in actual fact, we can probably expect it's closer to about 15%. That means that if you're putting dollars into a savings account, you're losing anywhere from 7.9% to about 15%. And that's just talking about US dollars. I was in Lebanon a couple of months ago and the inflation was, I think it was at 1700% or something like wow. that. Yeah, it's ridiculous. The country is absolutely collapsing. I've been to Zimbabwe and they were at millions of percent. I was just in Argentina. It's at a hundred percent a year. Like there's just, it is absolutely irresponsible what is happening with these country. And that's because we've lost touch of what sound money is. So I'm very much into tangible things, um, you know, working businesses that produce something and produce something of value. I like agricultural land. I like apartments and condos and real estate. I like precious metals. I like things that are, are backed by real life things. Um, that is, is the direction after the last 23 years of exploring it and doing this, that is what I have seen. And I like to put my money into things that speak to those types of values, opposed to using a lot of these complicated um, financial instruments where it's completely manipulated and you have no idea what's going on. And even if you have a PhD, you won't understand. There's so much obscurity out there in the market. So, Yes, it is important that you start learning about it, but I would direct you in a place that is something that is based on Austrian School of Economics. That is the absolute best is what I've seen in my life. So it's interesting because in the US and in Canada, people are trying to figure out like in real estate or stocks, they're just looking at one country and how do they allocate their their money and their finance and where to invest and and place it to grow their nest egg or their retirement funds and everything like that and try to have their money work the hardest for them for you you've taken that country one country and expanded it into the entire world essentially how do you decide where are you going to place your funds, which countries and and where to do it? Because I feel like for you, there's so many places that you could do it at this point. So it's not just for me that there's so many places that I can do this. Yeah. Literally anybody out there in the world can start to explore these things. And, you know, I encourage your audience to go check out my work at expatmoney.com or to come and check out our summit. We've got a big, um, a huge online summit happening. It's uh, expatmoneysummit.com where you guys can find out a lot more information about these types of things. But um, one of the first things that I'm looking at are the laws of the country. So how have they handled situations in the past? Is it a civil law or a common law country? Or do they follow Sharia law? You know, what does this look like? What are their capital controls on funds? Who can invest in the country? What is the taxation like? What are the laws for owning real estate and property there? Um, you know, taxation is the absolute first thing that you should be trying to understand. How do you legally reduce your taxation? This is about more freedom, not freedom less freedom. So I don't screw around in the gray zone or the black zone. You know, everything we do is compliant. But once you've left the US and Canada, you have a lot more options available to you um, for legally reducing your tax bill. Now, as a US citizen, you are required to file taxes based on your worldwide income and pay taxes on anything that is due to you. You know, uh, the U.S. is one of two countries in the world which taxes based on residency and citizenship. As Canada, as Canadians, we only pay taxation based on our residency. And that's the majority of the other countries in the world, like most of Western Europe and Australia and things like that. Now, I'm not giving individual tax advice, but just understand that once you leave your country of birth and move somewhere else, it can be a lot more... Um, sunnier, you can say, in this regard. So I specialize in offshore jurisdictions. And an offshore jurisdiction really just means that they have strong asset protection laws and zero or close to zero taxation. So you can take a country like Panama, where I live today, they have what's called the territorial tax system, which means you're only paying taxes based on 
uh, income, which is derived inside the country. Now, you can still live in Panama and have an online business and have your clients outside of Panama, and that will be deemed foreign sourced income, which means you're not paying any taxes in Panama for that. So if you have an online business, if you're a consultant or a coach, or you do Amazon FBA, or you do drop shipping or anything like this, anything really online, then Panama is not going to tax you. And it's not just Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Belize, and where I used to live in the Middle East, it goes even one step better. They don't even have income tax. It doesn't exist. You know, I lived in Abu Dhabi for eight years. There is no income tax there whatsoever. There's no wealth tax. There's no corporate tax. There's no inheritance tax. So now it's like, wow, if you can get rid of all of that taxation, then your cost of living is maybe a quarter or a fifth or a tenth of what it would be back home. These are the, the geo arbitrage that we were discussing you know, a few minutes ago. And then you start looking at healthcare, which might also be you know, a quarter of the price or your insurance costs, which are a quarter of the price. Now things start to really make sense. Now you can really be part of that 1% and you can do it in an honest and ethical manner. You can build your life in a way that makes sense for you and give your family all the opportunities you know, maybe you didn't grow up with as a child, you know, but it's all about living your life to the maximum, you know, as long as you are, and I, I keep saying this, as long as you're doing it honestly and ethically, then absolutely you have the right to do this. We have one life to live. As far as anyone on planet earth can convince me, Eileen, we have one life to live. So you might as well make the most of it. So if you look back when you first started like your entrepreneurship, building up your business, and you look at the portfolio that you had um, and you allocated your wealth at certain different places, what did that percentage look like in the different places where you're allocating your money and spending the most time on versus what it looks like today after you've built up and established yourself and your business? Yeah. I mean, when I first started, I was just testing out many, many, many things. Like I was saying before, I started with stocks and equities. Then I started getting into derivatives. Um, and from there, I started moving into real estate and uh, and precious metals. Even when I was doing a lot of the trading, I really always enjoyed um, commodities and these types of investments. In today's day and age, you know, I'm a lot more diversified. I have a lot more stable and, and more conservative uh, investments. I have a larger portion of precious metals. I believe that gold and silver are, and I mean, physical gold and silver, not paper gold, and stored 100% allocated, 100% segregated, which basically means that if you have a bar of gold and you put it in the vault, it has a serial number on it. That is yours. If you come back in in a month or a year or in a hundred years, you get that exact same bar back. It never enters into the, ba the balance sheet of the company who is being a custodian for it. So it doesn't become um, their ownership. I mean, it's still yours. So it's very different than a bank, let's say, when you put money into a bank account. Uh, so I'm very much into precious metals. And I'm very much into a lot of the cryptocurrency, what's happening right now. So I have managed accounts. I work with a a crypto hedge fund based out of Switzerland, where I've put my own money in and they're literal geniuses who are looking at the overall trends in the world and what's happening and how the technology is playing out. Um, and then I also own a lot of Bitcoin. I was fortunate enough to get into Bitcoin when it was three figures. Uh, I wish I had gotten in at two figures, but uh, <laughs> but three figures is still pretty pretty okay. Um, I've been talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and these types of things on my program on the Expat Money Show and my work at expatmoney.com for many years now. I think that there's a lot to be said for that. Am I going to put every single penny that I earn into it? No, I am not. But I think that it is important to have an exposure to it. I think it is the future. And I think that for big business and for the big accounting firms, for triple entry bookkeeping, it makes a lot of sense to have these types of technologies. And then real estate. I mean, I'm a big proponent, once again, for tangible assets, a home, you know, a roof over someone's head, a field where we produce food that people consume. You know, I don't think that this will ever go out of fashion. It will never stop being important. Um, so those are kind of the changes between, you know, over the last 15 or 20 years of going through this and really what I focus on now, let's say. And what are you fired up about today? I am very fired up about a lot of the commodities. And I really look at uh, 
anything that is going to fight inflation or traditionally does well against inflation. So gold, silver, platinum, palladium, uh, oil, natural gas, uranium, um, agricultural things, uh, wheat, barley, rye, you know, these types of things I am really looking very closely at. I can see that there's huge political shifts and geopolitical shifts in the world. And with the war in Ukraine and one of the largest bread baskets going down in the world, and with Turkey trying to broker deals, which were doing very well and are now not doing very well. And what's that going to mean for the future? Um, all of those tangible things I'm really looking at. I also see one of the other biggest trends in the world will be the future of governance. So basically how humans organize ourselves, looking at government instead of as subjects or as slaves, but instead as consumers and countries that are also trying to take these ideas and put them into practice. So what does that mean? That means trying to attract really good talent, trying to attract entrepreneurs, trying to attract uh, wealth and capital into their borders and giving them advantages, whether that be tax advantages or a higher standard of living. And then even at the micro level of building physical communities, so special economic zones, um, you know, Zetis, uh, private cities, charter cities, things like this. Uh, these can be gated or walled communities that have special permissions or special provisions or special laws um, that allow you to run this community in a way which speaks to well, to the charter of how it was set up. So just these, these ideas of how humans organize themselves and what it's going to mean for the 21st century, uh, I think are really huge. I think that the, the traditional nation state is a 19th and 20th century idea. And as check, technology changes and blockchain and artificial intelligence and robotics and AI and all of these things, I think that there's going to be massive changes in, in governance. So those are the main ideas that I'm excited about. Yes, a lot of them are very cutting edge. A lot of them are at the forefront of this. And I'm probably quite early in many regards. I don't think that this is a tomorrow thing. This is a, a beginning of a trend, which will take us over the next 20 to 40 to 50 years, I would say. So Mikhail, what is your version of a FIRE financial independence and retirement? What does that look like to you? So I do not want to retire in that I'm going to sit on a beach or do nothing. I'm a pretty high energy person and I always have like a million things on the go. And we've just kind of touched on a lot of them uh, today. Like, I mean, okay, I have my consulting business, which is my main business, helping people to move offshore, dealing with their tax issues and uh, their immigration issues. I really like the immigration concept. And then we put together summits, you know, free summits, because I want to get the education out there. You know, that's at expatmoneysummit.com. Um, I've wrote one book. We have a second book coming out now. We have plans to write another 19 books. These are all guidebooks of different and countries series. and how to move things. Yeah, a giant series of books. We actually have the first one, which is coming out hopefully this year in the next couple of months. And then another four, which are written, but we need to do the proofreading and the editing. And then another 15 that are planned for this. So these will be expats guide to Mexico, expats guide to Panama, expats guide to Costa Rica, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I sit on the board of directors for a nonprofit. I actually have my board of directors meeting in 20, 24 minutes from now. I have to uh, I have to go for that. I volunteer my time uh, helping out with this organization. It's a it's a nonprofit in Uganda helping teen mothers to be able to support themselves. We're talking about 14, 15 year old girls who got pregnant who their family has turned their backs on them, or maybe they don't have a family. They're illiterate. They have no one to support them. They have no skills or anything like that. We take them into our roof. We have a, a halfway house. We teach them entrepreneurial skills. We get them back on with their feet and we are there to support them. It's not about giving away money or charity. It's about supporting them and making them self-sufficient. Uh, I sit on the board of directors for that. I don't take a salary for that. I, my business partner, she doesn't take a salary for that. We actually tithe our own money. We we donate our own money to that. Uh, I run a school with my business partner, Michael Strong, on uh, called Expat International School. It's actually Expat International School of Freedom and Entrepreneurship. And it's a schooling option, which I'm very passionate about because of what I went through 
with public education, I believe that private education is a lot better and having conversations about ideas instead of rote memorization. So what I'm trying to say is, yes, I am financially independent. Yes, I am a multimillionaire. I have built successful businesses. I've invested wisely over the years and I've grown a, a company which people are, are happy to exchange their dollars for my expertise. However, I don't want to sit around and do nothing. I have so many ideas in my head. I'm a really creative person. I like to, I like to build things and, and, you know, take an idea and a concept in my head and then figure out how does it all work together and what are the pitfalls and how can I help more people and how can I implement it as a vertical in my own businesses, which help grow the, the universe, the empire that I'm building, you know, one thing into another, into another, how do I support people? And that's what I'm doing with the school. You know, I saw that with my private clients, they needed an education for their children and there was nothing that was a viable option for them. So I went out there and I created it. That's a vertical in my own business, you know, and I just keep doing this over and over and over again. So yes, I am financially well off. I'm financially independent, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to sit around and do nothing. You know, I'm almost 40 years old. I still, I, I plan on living to be 120, <laughs> 150 years old. So I got a lot of gas still left in the tank, you could say. And circling the world a couple more hundred times along the way. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Mikkel, I mean, I loved everything that you talked about and everything that you shared with us today. And I mean, we could go on and on and on because there's just so much that we can unpack there. Um, but I wanted to get us to our fire round where I'm going to rapid fire question, send you a couple of questions your way and then, you know, feel free to answer as you see fit. Are you ready for that? Yes, I will do my best. <laughs> All right. So the first one is if you become a billionaire tomorrow, you might already be a billionaire, but if you do become a billionaire, <laughs> what would your day look like? You know what? Uh, I'm certainly not a billionaire now. I'm, I'm financially well off. That's a different level. Um, my goodness, what would I do? Well, I would still be wanting to help people. I would still be creating a lot of content and having conversations about ideas. Um, that is so much fun and it's so rewarding. I love learning and I love exploring. You know, I was traveling and exploring the world when I was hitchhiking and I had a backpack and a jar of peanut butter and a tent and I had no and money. And, yeah. And camels. <laughs> and I was traveling when I was, you know, a single guy and I was doing it myself. And now I'm, you know, well off and we're staying at fancy resorts and I have the nanny. I mean, I, I'm a happily married man. I got two kids. I, we travel with our nanny and we stay in five star resorts and we travel first class, a business class. It probably wouldn't, none of that would change. Maybe I would just be flying charter instead of first class or something like that, but I would still be out there exploring. I would still be out there trying to understand the world. So money doesn't change that whether I was, you know, only had $2 to rub together or I had lots of money or I had the next level of money. It's who I am, you know? So it comes down to, to my character and at my core, what I believe in. And let's say you had lost everything today and you had to start back from ground zero and somebody had handed you a $500,000 check and said, go build yourself back up again. What would be the first thing that you would do? Oh, wow. That's a cool question. Um, you know, it's kind of similar to my last answer. Like I would still be out there doing the same type of work. I think content creation is the best type of work that you can do. So really becoming an expert on, on a certain topic, uh, talking about it, but it's at the same time still being humble enough to know and understand that you don't know everything. Like in my program, I don't come at it like, I'm master of the universe. I know everything. No, I try to find people who are way smarter than I am and who have specialties and expertise that I don't have. Then I ask them things that I think are really interesting and I want to know the answer to. And from that, um, other people, I believe, also want to know the answer to it. So, you know, either I would continue in the same type of uh, industry and knowledge base that I am now, or I would pick something else, which is a very high value, something that people would pay for and expertise, which is not too crowded. 
And I would start interviewing people and I would start learning about it. And I would start creating content and courses and memberships and continuity and consulting and masterminds and workshops and anything and everything that I could to try to empower and inspire and help people in that industry. That is what I did last time. And it worked really well. And that's what I would do again. I would rinse, rinse, lather and repeat. This is a good transition, a, a good segue to the next one. So you're also a podcast host. And we you just mentioned about being able to interview people, creating content creation. If you were able to interview anybody in the world, who would that be? You know, I've been pretty fortunate. Most of the people that I've wanted to interview, I've already interviewed. Um, I had a big goal to interview Doug Casey. He has been a big inspiration in my life. Uh, I got to interview him about four or five years ago. He has since become a friend of mine. Uh, he's a really incredible man. The work that he's done in his life and his travels and in ex his expertise have been fantastic. Uh, I actually now talk to him on a very regular basis. I've been invited to his home. I've traveled overseas to see him. We've had dinner together. We've you know, met in different countries and smoked cigars and drank rum together. And he's an amazing person. So anytime I get to have a conversation with him is fantastic. Uh, I also got to interview Jim Rogers uh, about five years ago, I would say. Uh, Jim Rogers changed my life possibly more than any other man in the world. Um, he started writing books about the rise of China and, and what that is going to mean in the world. Um, I listened to a lot of his things and I decided that I wanted my children to speak Mandarin. So um, I actually got married to a woman from mainland China and my children are fluent in Mandarin. And I've been there over 30 times and we've invested in the country and bought real estate there. And it has a very huge part of my life. Uh, Jim Rogers should be speaking at our event. We're just uh, finalizing things right now. So he'll also be speaking at the event. Doug Casey speaking at my event. These are men that I really admire. Um, there's a lot of people like this. Um, Richard Mayberry, who's another person who's had a huge impact in my life. Um, he writes a newsletter called The Early Warning Report, which I've read for six years, who's really shaped my life. Um, so I've been very fortunate. For people who I have not interviewed, um, let's see. Um, Jim Rickards, I think, would be a really cool person to have a conversation with. Um, I don't know. I think that's about it. You know, I I, I, I go after the people that I want to talk that's to. That's awesome. You know, <laughs> you know like I, I go after it and I, I try to provide value to them and, and make things make sense for them. Um, so I, I've been pretty good. Yeah, Jim Rickards, I think, would be a pretty cool one to interview. Maybe maybe next year. Awesome. And Mikkel, how can our audience and listeners find out more about you and what you're doing? Sure. So... Um, I have a podcast. It's called The Expat Money Show. If you guys want to go to whatever platform that you're listening to Eileen and I speak on right now, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and you type in Expat Money Show, you should see me come up right at the beginning. Otherwise, you can type in my name anywhere on Google, M-I-K-K-E-L-T-H-O-R-U-P, Mikkel Thorpe. Uh, I've been interviewed probably about 200 times now. We've done 220 episodes of my podcast. I spoke on stage all over the world about these concepts and ideas. Um, and then you can go to expatmoney.com, our website. We put out daily blog articles about immigration and taxation and asset protection and, and living overseas, like general lifestyle of being an expat. We have uh, regular webinars, monthly webinars. We do get togethers. We have meetups. We do trips. We have conferences. We have masterminds. Uh, you can become a private client if you need a bit more hand holding through it. But uh, expatmoney.com should point you in the right direction. Explore that website. Tons of stuff there. Tons and tons of stuff there. But yeah, very happy to help your audience. And, uh, and it's been a fun conversation today. So thank you very much for the opportunity, Eileen. Oh, no, thank you, Mikhail. I'm really grateful that you've been able to come on and share with our listeners uh, your background, your expertise, and what you've been doing today in the space. So thank you so much, Mikhail. I really appreciate it. Pleasure is all mine. Thanks, Eileen. All the links mentioned in this episode are included in the show notes. And if you love this episode, please leave us a rating and review on Apple iTunes. The link is also included in the show notes. And we would really appreciate your help in spreading the word to more high-income earners on how they too can maximize both their time and money. 
Also, if you still haven't joined our High Income Earners Facebook group, you are missing out on High Income Earners community where we help each other reach our own version of FIRE. 